Do you mind restating sort of what you were talking about? Yeah, so it's been about a month since House Bill 4002 recriminalizing drug possession statewide went into effect. And so far, 72 uh, people have been referred for deflection to Multnomah County from law enforcement. Is that the, sort of the number that we had projected? I know there was some data explaining like more or less how many people per day or per week we had thought this would impact. Is that sort of in line with you, what you guys had predicted? It's a bit more. I, I think that uh, there was, we were unsure what the flow would look like. I think everybody has been learning along the way uh, about how many people might be eligible for deflection and willing to choose deflection. So um, this is a, a lesson and it, is going to inform how the program rolls out moving forward. Do we know percentage-wise of the people arrested for this offense, how many were eligible for deflection and how many weren't, like percentage? So that information would be tracked by law enforcement, Multnomah County Sheriff's Office uh, booking data. So uh, they would be best equipped to answer that okay, question. Okay, they haven't provided you with any of that yet? Uh, no, but they're working on it. Okay. And then I did get those, that, those questionnaires from OHSU. Did they just send you guys those questionnaires? I think that's sort of what I understood is that that information was just kind of forwarded over to the counties. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's pretty recent, uh, but the county is aware of it and they're actually prepared to fill those out. So can you talk to me a little bit about how this will work? There's four different questionnaires and they each come in at different points throughout the deflection process, right? One of them is during assessment, one of them is later on at the end and stuff like that. How are you guys incorporating these questionnaires at this point? Well, the county and the county's partners are um, going to need to respond to uh, the Criminal Justice Commission's requirements for reporting. So um, whatever the Criminal Justice Commission uh, puts out for that criteria, the county and its partners will make sure that they're in compliance for it. Um, in terms of uh, the specifics and uh, how, how that will be applied in the field, that's more of a, a question for our partners and uh, for the data team, and we can look back uh, and get an answer for you for that. It, you know, this is new. They, they just kind of sent mm -hmm. this questionnaire out recently. Have you guys had meetings with the partners? How regularly are you meeting with these partners, and are you getting any feedback on how difficult it's going to be to collect some of this data that the CJC is asking for? The county is meeting with its deflection partners uh, on a very frequent basis. There are daily conversations between the county and the people on the ground who are doing the outreach. And the requirements of uh, deflection reporting are new in our community. So, the, you know, the nonprofit providers who deliver the services, they're all, you know, pretty small teams uh, who are really focused on outreach. So this is all uh, a, a learn as you go sort of process. And I think that um, we're, co we're confident that we're gonna be able to get the reporting infrastructure in place. Uh, it might take a, a month or two uh, to get up to speed, but so far what we've heard is that um, it's, it's a lot of, uh, it's gonna be a lot of uh, data gathering uh, but uh, the providers are preparing to get that into place. Are there more roles that need to be hired to be able to do this? I mean, it seems like they, they have to track these people down sometimes because they don't even know where they live or where they are in that moment. So like, these are people that have entered deflection but may be engaging with some of the services, not all of the services, and they are, they're gonna have to track them down to collect all of this data. Is there somebody is there a role that you guys are creating for some of that data collection that wasn't created before? That hasn't been discussed quite yet. Uh, what I can say is that this is a workforce uh, that is very um, uh, uh, strained in terms of uh, hiring. Um, it, there's a shortage of, of workers who are able to uh, do the outreach and do the uh, do, do all this legwork. So. Uh, it's something that we're all aware of and trying to uh, navigate. How surprised are some of these providers by the level of data that the CJC is wanting in, in these questionnaires? Or are they surprised? Is this something they, they expected? Um, I would ask the providers, uh, 4D Recovery or Volunteers of America, they would be uh, more equipped to talk about what they're experiencing daily. Um, but reporting is part of the contract these providers know how to 
to do reporting as part of uh, their monitoring. And uh, it's just a matter of getting up to speed with the new expectations and making sure that uh, everything is done in a timely fashion. Um, are they doing this electronically? I mean, the questionnaires I got were like PDF documents, but I assume you guys have some systems to collect these data. Do you know how that will work? Uh, I, I would, again, defer to the providers about what their data collection process looks like. Uh, you know, it, it, essentially, there's, they have to, the reporters have to gather information at, at the caseworker level about you know, the client interactions that are happening, and then they have to uh, distill that all into a, another format for reporting purposes. One of the things, and I did ask this in the email, so maybe, you, you know, you're able to answer it now, but the, you had mentioned that multiple, or that people could be re referred to multiple different services while in deflection. So they could be referred to a shelter, they could be referred to AA meetings, they could be also referred to, you know, treatment and, and that type of thing. Um, with the deflection, success or non-success, how many of these services that they're referred to do they have to engage with? Is it sufficient for them to engage with one to say that they've successfully completed deflection? It's going to be individual based on what's in the individualized treatment plan that is developed uh, at the time of uh, outreach. So it might be recommended that somebody enroll in an outpatient behavioral health resource program with peer support. Maybe it's two separate referrals and they have to uh, follow through on the recommendations in their treatment plan. So um, whatever is, uh, whatever criteria is laid out in the treatment plan as the next step that they have to complete, it's on that individual to uh, follow through. And uh, then if, if they follow through as laid out in the plan, then they are uh, successful in their deflection. All of the plan or yeah. just part of the yeah, plan? It would have it. to be yeah. all of the plan. Yeah. That's what the county has communicated to providers is don't mark this as a completed successful deflection unless they follow through with all of the plan? Yes. Okay. Um, and then so far, I know it's soon to talk about success or, or failure. I mean, do you know how many people have reached that 30-day mark out of the 70, you said 77? Uh, 72. Uh, oh, okay. And um, at, so at this time, uh, the county is just beginning to find out about the first individuals who were deflected 30 days ago. So that would be around uh, September 3rd or September 4th, just a few days into deflection. So um, it's only a handful of people who have uh, either uh, completed or not completed deflection yet. And um, the, you know, I, as this program rolls for out and in the coming weeks, that information will become a lot more uh, uh, robust. Do you know right now more or less where it stands? Are there more people out of that handful that have failed or more people that have succeeded or do you not have that at all yet? Not off the top of my head, but what I can say is that um, there are people who have completed deflection successfully and there are some people who uh, have not followed through on uh, the criteria that's been laid out for them and that is uh, laid out in their case file. So at the next point, if they ever encounter law enforcement again, law enforcement will uh, know whether or not that person is eligible for deflection again. Um, failing deflection is also if law enforcement catch them again with drugs within 30 days. Has that happened and do we have a number for that? That hasn't been reported to us yet. As in the sheriff's office is not giving you that data or it hasn't been reported that it's happened? Uh, to our knowledge, we, we don't have any uh, examples of that happening yet. Okay. Well, that's good, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, can you talk generally about how you feel it's going so far, what some of the provider feedback has been, what some of law enforcement's feedback has been? People who have somebody in their life who have experienced addiction might relate to what it's like to go through recovery. And the reality is, is that it's going to take oftentimes multiple attempts to get, uh, to get into recovery and to, to be successful in recovery. So one thing that was expected and that we are seeing is that uh, recovery doesn't happen overnight. Um, it, it takes a, a lot of um, a, attempts to, uh, to get that um, habit uh, change. Um, the neuroscience of addiction shows us that 
it often takes numerous attempts to uh, re achieve recovery, especially when you're addicted to something as potent as fentanyl. So you're saying that's kind of the feedback that you're getting is, is in line with what you guys had expected, that yes. people would be coming back over and over again. Um, with the, the 77 people, 72, I'm sorry, people so far just this month alone, um, how does that compare to the amount of beds we have? I mean, the county has fewer than 77 beds available at any point in time, I would think. There's a statewide shortage of beds available. And there's also a shortage of people who can do the, the, the outreach work and the, uh, uh, the work to support that uh, recovery. Uh, so the county and, and other counties across the state are all facing that same reality and uh, we're all doing what we can with the resources that we have. There have been some numbers that you guys had estimated for the deflection center itself. It seems like those numbers are going to have to be a lot higher in terms of the people that would be entering into the deflection center on a daily basis. It's going to be, uh, you know, based on the data we have so far, sometimes uh, in a day there might be uh, seven or eight deflections. Um, other days it might be one or two. Uh, so that information has been, it's being collected and shared with the, uh, the, the operator, Turk House, so that they have an expectation about what it's going to be like on the first day. How are they doing with hiring? Where are we at right now? I know we said mid-October to end of October. We're, we're almost there. Yeah, the county is on track uh, to opening in mid to late October. Uh, the county has cleared uh, major hurdles with opening the facility itself. Hiring, Turk House has had success hiring staff to do the actual work, and now it's just a matter of finalizing protocols and f getting familiar with the center. Um, what are you hearing from law enforcement and the teams that are out there? Is it an approach that you might be continuing in terms of having the center, but also having the teams that can meet law enforcement and that type of thing? What we are hearing from law enforcement as well as from the city of Portland yeah, elected leaders is uh, open this center. We need a place to send people uh, who uh, we encounter who are eligible for deflection. Um, the mobile field deflection has also been uh, successful uh, in the sense that uh, we're able to uh, make contact with people and do outreach. And even when uh, law enforcement is not making calls for deflection, outreach workers are, are using any downtime they have to do additional uh, interactions with people uh, who uh, you know might uh, you know not necessarily be uh, you know under arrest but might uh, eventually want to get uh, into recovery um, so what we're finding is that the mobile deflection has allowed for a more robust outreach process and, and that's what the providers are telling us so are you going to continue along that same approach? So you'll have the deflection center and then you'll also have those mobile teams still working the way that they are now? Well, especially in East County, uh, that's going to continue. Um, you, you know uh, over in East County that there's, that's a, a, a corner of the county where um, it might take a little bit more time to get to the actual deflection center. So uh, outreach is going to play heavily into uh, the deflection in East County and we'll see if it goes county, if it continues countywide. I can't remember what your exact response was to this when we were talking via text maybe a month ago about the necessity to have that center. Do you remember sort of what your explanation had been? It made sense to me when you had texted to me. I'm a little vague on it right now. And if you want to look at the phone again, we can look at that. But I don't know if you remember the response that you had given me about why it's medically necessary to have that center and, and if you could restate some of that. So as part of the deflection center, um, there, it will scale up into a sobering uh, center it with um, 16 beds uh, for sobering services. And then eventually the county will move into a permanent sobering center with upwards of uh, 50 sobering beds. What we know is that there needs, excuse me, can I restate that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, what we know is that this county needs more resources for sobering and uh, detox. and. What is important is that people have a place uh, to sober up and, uh, and also uh, that medication for uh, opioid use disorder is available and people have the opportunity to uh, recover under medical supervision. Fentanyl uh, is a potent substance that 
uh, needs uh, supervision from a medical professional to, uh, to recover from. Um, because what we're finding is that people who are heavily addicted to fentanyl uh, need help coming off of it. So this, the sobering center itself, without being there, they can't be there 24 hours. It has to be less than 24 hours, right? Uh, yeah. In, yeah. In the facility that's yeah. now told moves to the permanent center. Yeah. What is the use uh, of, of that? Why, why do we need the center when it's under 24 hours? What can be done in that amount of time mm -hmm. that can't be done by mobile units? Well, I, part of it is that there are more substances than just fentanyl. You know, alcohol is another example of a substance that, uh, that requires a sobering center. And what people need in this community is a resource uh, to uh, achieve uh, you know, sobriety uh, and uh, the sobering center will help with that. And uh, as for people with a more severe substance use disorder, uh, such as uh, fentanyl or methamphetamine, uh, the sobering center is gonna be uh, a, a place to uh, get some uh, early assistance and then uh, th through that process, there will also uh, likely be uh, access to uh, medication assisted treatment uh, to help uh, keep people, uh, help curb cravings to, uh, to those substances. I, I want to look up, if you don't mind, the response that you gave me, now that I you know, gave you what I'm looking for, do you mind explaining more why that indoor space is needed for people that are recovering with less than 24 hours? Yeah, so, you know, at the deflection center, when it, uh, in, it becomes a sobering space, the the person who enters that space will have access to a nurse. The nurse will triage that person and also there will be peer outreach workers who will be there to help uh, determine uh, what might be some appropriate next steps for that individual. During that time they'll also have access to up to 24 hours of sobering which will help uh, begin uh, the withdrawal phase at which point uh, medication for uh, opioid use disorder can be dispensed and that individual can uh, begin uh, medication assisted treatment. So while they're at that sobering center with less than 24 hours, they can already start beginning that, that medication assisted treatment? Uh, yes, and what is important is that there is a space to have an intervention uh, and to also uh, determine whether or not that person has any other immediate health needs that can be addressed. It's not going to happen if this person's continuing to sleep on the street. So even if they do go to the sobering center and they get the medication, the nurse there is not going to prescribe them the medication unless they have a safer place to go to, like a shelter or a room somewhere or something, is from what I understand, right? Like usually they won't get prescribed this medication if they're still on the street. So the, the county is, is actually, uh, you know, county clinics offer medications for opioid use disorder. And the county is also in the process of launching um, a, a mobile uh, medication, uh, sorry, the county is also in the process of launching a mobile medication assisted treatment uh, van where people can receive uh, those services in the field. So uh, the county is prepared for that reality, knowing that people are going to need to recover uh, who may also be experiencing homelessness and uh, we, the county is meeting those people where they're at. So let's look at how this process is going to go. They get picked up, they get referred to deflection, they get taken to the, the deflection center, which has a nurse. The nurse says, yeah, we want to give you one of these medications that will help you. Let's get you stabilized within the next 23 hours. And then perhaps you have to go back to your tent. If they take you back to your tent, then there's a mobile van that follows up with the medication or is, is that? that? That would be one scenario in phase two when the sobering center is open. Um, another scenario is that there is a bed of, that is available uh, that that person can be referred to. Okay, well that makes sense sort of as, as the chain and then do you know once the sobering center is open it will be will be fully in phase two so it will be medication services and everything will be available already at the center? Um, I would, uh, let, let's go back and, and look at the, um, the document that has the full phase one, two, and three so that we can be crystal clear on what, what services are offered when. I guess the question is will there be uh, opioid or withdrawal in general medication at the sobering center starting when it opens this month? 
Uh, not this month. Uh, in, in phase two, the uh, sobering center will uh, actually have sobering beds. Um, and then uh, in phase three, it becomes a permanent. But uh, for the first uh, few months of the deflection center, it will not have, it have sobering beds. So it won't have any medication for withdrawal in the first, this month? Uh, not in the deflection center. Okay, so what's gonna be happening there then? That's just where essentially what they're already doing right now on the streets they'll be doing there. It, it's, a, uh, it's a triage space where you know, there will be nurses there who can uh, determine people's medical needs. Uh, there will be access to hygiene services uh, and, um, and peer services to make uh, sure that that person is um, willing to engage in treatment and, uh, and receive a referral to um, a, based on their treatment recommendations. Um, there will also be um, uh, access to uh, you know, outreach providers who uh, are going to maintain contact with the individual after they leave the, the deflection center. How close are we to a good neighborhood agreement at this point? Uh, those are still in discussions uh, and the county is working as much as it can with the neighbors to uh, to get there. Um, the county is uh, is feeling uh, like there has been progress in the discussions, um, but uh, I can't give a specific date yet. Okay, I think that's, do you have any questions? Anything you want to add? Um, I, I think I'm good. Thank okay, you. thanks Ryan, yeah. appreciate it.